Hello, everyone. Today, I am joined by Elsie Yudicello, who lives in South Florida with her husband, four young boys on a farm full of animals. She is a writer, farmer, speaker, teacher, and seeker of adventure. Elsie is passionate about encouraging homeschool moms, reading beautiful books, cooking for big crowds, and raising her boys to be men of God. You can catch her on Instagram, in monthly articles at bewildandfree.org, and you can read more from Elsie at Farmhouse Schoolhouse. And I think, I, well, I've been following you on Instagram, and I was actually trying to rack my brain figuring out how I originally started following you, and I don't know, but I, I really enjoy your content there. So I'm really excited to get to chat with you today. Here at the beginning, I mean, I give like the formal bio, but tell us who you are, your family, and then how you got started homeschooling. Well, I was born and raised in Miami. I am Cuban, super Cuban. Whole family is Cuban. Um, my great uncle um, was one of the leaders of the Bay of Pigs invasion. And Eleanor Roosevelt, after he was captured, helped negotiate a release of our family and the families of other prisoners. So we are like extra Cuban. My husband is from Pennsylvania. He is Italian, a little bit Russian. So ample opportunity for sanctification for our family. Um, we we met in college and um, spent a year together working in a student ministry. And then he went to Honduras for nine months and we ended up writing letters back and forth. So we actually fell in love over snail mail, which is feels like so out of place for our generation, but that's what happened with us. And it was really great. <laughs> oh, that is so romantic. I love it. Did you guys always always know that you went into homeschool or is that something that came later on? No. So uh, at the school where we went to was the first time I really started meeting homeschoolers. And I was very, very, very confused by the whole idea. And the church that we went to was rife with homeschoolers. And um, I was very curious about them. I was at the time getting my secondary education certificate from that school. And so I would ask them questions here and there. Um, and it, the vocabulary of their lifestyle just kind of became like a, how do we say that in English, like an earworm, where it was just constantly like playing in the back of my mind as I was doing all my certifications and things. And um, so we didn't go in um, thinking that we were going to homeschool, but what ended up happening? <laughs> So now how has your then approach to education or your thoughts about homeschooling in particular kind of grown and changed over the years? How old are your kiddos now? Uh, my eldest is in high school. He is a freshman this year. And my youngest um, has special needs numerically. He's 10. I think he's more like maybe eight um, emotionally. Um, and, you know, like everybody else, I rolled into homeschool with a lot of uh, my own like educational baggage and I kind of had to unpack things and decide what I was going to keep and what I was going to put on the shelf and what was going to go in the garbage. Um, and uh, I don't think I started out with any one particular philosophy other than uh, this one lady that I had read a little bit of, um, Charlotte Mason was her name. And someone handed me her book when I was uh, teaching my last teaching job. And there were things that she was saying where I was like, wow, that feels like really intuitive, like things that I was naturally thinking and like very confused about when I was sitting in those education classes because they were presenting something that was not this. And this kind of explains why I always felt a little at war within myself. Um, but that took a long time to develop and understand, um, a really long time. <laughs> So how did you begin implementing those Charlotte Mason ideas then? Did you try to implement them from the beginning or did that sort of grow over time? Definitely grew over time. Um, I was a little confused when I first started because um, I, I love reading. I read all the time. And so, you know, by the time I was seriously getting into it, I had started to really read what she was writing. And I kept seeing um, a lot of people saying that they were Charlotte Mason. And then I'd hang out with them and I'd be like, did I misread? Like, am I, am I missing a volume? Because it just, it wasn't the same thing. Um, and then there was uh, a professor that I had in college uh, for our rhetoric class. He uh, had us read uh, Quintilian. And um, 
I'm not a passive reader. I argue with books and write in the margins. I'm like a wrecker of books because I just, I have conversations with people. And on the first page of Quintilian, it says, que, at the top, like what? Like I was so confused. Um, but I remember hearing things in that book and then hearing things in Charlotte Mason and being like, these two things um, belong together. Classical and Charlotte Mason belong together. And it wasn't until we tried to actually put flesh on our homeschool with the people that we lived with that we were like, okay, like this is how we get this off the page and into our home. And it was a little heartbreaking because I'm, I was super idealistic and I wanted the whole page to come in the house. I wanted every word to be in the house. And so there was a lot of dying to self and a little death of little dreams um, here and there, but little by little. And that was, it was a grace that my kids started out as babies. <laughs> I didn't have to have it figured out right then and there all at once. Um, you know, we're still piecing together little things um, as we go along. It has been a lot of learning, a lot of mentoring from people far away. We live in a place now where we have um, a large homeschool community. But when we first started out, it was, it was crickets. There's no one around us. And that hurt. That was hard. <laughs> I think that's really encouraging, though, for moms to hear your story, because I think so many of us, whether someone is inspired and motivated by Charlotte Mason philosophy or, or whatever it is, um, that we come in with these ideals, right? And these this grand and glorious visions of what it's going to be. And then we try to bring that into our actual home with our actual embodied souls, right, who are right there with us. Last season on the podcast, I talked to one of my oldest friends, uh, and actually my she's the leader of my in-person book club, so I like twisted her arm and got her on the podcast with me, but I loved what she said. She said something about like, I had to learn that I couldn't have all of my like educational, she didn't call them like the babies or like the, like whatever, the ide ideals. Like she said, I had to learn that sometimes that wasn't what love looked like right here. And I thought that was so beautiful because if we're motivated by love and the love of neighbor and love of God, these real humans, we're able to then take the ideals and the principles and apply them in a way that blesses our family rather than becomes a burden. And that's so important to remember. Yeah, I think um, in the last year, I've been thinking a lot about my own self education and um, the things that I have learned from Charlotte Mason and how valuable they have been um, to me. And there were things that I was looking at where I was like, man, I don't know if I'm ever going to get to this with my own kids. And this weird feeling of panic settled in like, I'm, I'm going to lose my chance. And then I thought that's so arrogant of me. Here I am, you know, at the age that I'm at as a mother with all these kids at this point in my life, and I'm still learning. And what makes me think that the that the final bell rings for them at 18 and they're not going to keep learning or keep searching things out for themselves. And that's a very humbling thing too. It takes a lot of pressure off, <laughs> you know, you're like, okay, like they're going to continue learning. They're going to continue with this. There's a lot that they're going to be getting for themselves in their own self-education. Yeah, God doesn't say he's going to continue working and completing the, the work in them until they're 18 and then they leave your home and time's up. No, he's like, he's going to be faithful to continue that good work, right, for the rest of their life. So that is a big relief as a mom. Absolutely. <laughs> well, what have been some of your favorite parts of homeschooling? Uh, the things that didn't go my way would probably be number one. Um. I don't know. I'm, I mean, I'm a maker of idols, truly. I, it's astounding. And I don't even realize I'm building them until they're already like, you know, halfway up off the ground. And then I'm like, look what I did. How gross. Um, and my kids are great at breaking idols and smashing them with large, heavy objects. So usually anything that doesn't go my way, because I have somehow managed again to make an idol out of it, kids come, smash it down, and they start their self-education. They start digging. They start learning and really doing it away in a way that I never would have thought to do. And it turns out being so wonderful. And so, yeah, I've often been my own worst enemy in homeschooling. So definitely the times it didn't go my own way. And then reading. Reading together has just, I mean, it has been one of the greatest gifts of my entire life. 
I think of all the places that we have been together and the adventures that we have shared and the commonalities, the things that have woven us um, to one another, how that's affected our relationships. There's times where we're in situations in real life where something happens and one of my kids will look at me and they'll just have to say one word, like a character's name or something. And I'm like, yep, like it's this little secret language that we have from all this time that we've um, spent together. I think about um, how formative that has been for my kids. You know, my angry little boy that just needed to meet Picket Pack Slayer and my other boy that is a beauty seeker and how his world changed when he met the Count of Monte Cristo and um, the boy that didn't like chores and no matter what I did could not get him to understand and see the value of chores and then what happened what changed his mind it wasn't a great lecture from me it was just meeting Edith Nesbitt and the Waterbury children and the railway children and all of a sudden it's like a light bulb went off and he wanted to be with us and wanted to help out I mean just it has been amazing. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's one of the beautiful parts of homeschooling for sure. And yeah. so much of that, what I'm hearing is not something that you've like done and created and like forced in on your children, but it's like you've provided a stage and then it's given space for the Lord to do this cool work in your kids and with you as a community and a family. And I, I love to hear that. It's a long I think one of our favorite ways to hang out, honestly, is just reading. I mean, nine times out of 10, if we're around each other and everyone is kind of like hitting a spot in the day where, you know, things are wrapping up, someone is going to say, let's get, I mean, right now we're reading a journey to the center of the earth and the once and future King. And so if there's any pocket of space in the day where they sniff it out and they're like, we could do this now. I mean, they're like, let's read, let's, let's have time together. And it's, oh, it's the best. I love that. Okay. So these are great parts of homeschooling. And yes. also homeschooling can sometimes be hard. <laughs> so could you share some of the challenges of homeschooling and then ways that you have sought to overcome those challenges? Um, so I'll share an old one and a recent one. Um, so the recent one is, um, it's really interesting when your children start getting older and you um, start sometimes being at odds with one another over things and you all of a sudden realize that you have to teach your children how to have good healthy interactions and responses to people that are in authority especially when they're at that age where they're wanting to challenge authority and so I you know prayed about it and talked to my husband and I'm like you know I just really feel like instead of being the voice across the room that they're responding to I want to be in their corner helping them, my voice next to them, helping them and encouraging them in their responses to the person across the room. So we're still homeschooling and he's still doing things here, but we have been inviting a lot more voice, different voices into his life, mentors and people. And that has been so healthy and so good. I've, I've never really, I mean, I kind of understand it when people are like, I've seen the village and I don't want it raising my children. Um, we don't live in isolation. We're meant to live in community and fellowship and with a village. So if you're choosing, you know, to unshackle yourself from government education, then what are you going to be not shackling yourself to, but, you know, what village are you joining? What community are you building up around you? So, um, you know, I had a much older homeschool mom ask me that question when my kids were like, Ooh, little, little, like five and six, like, who are the adults in your life? Like, who are the people that are going to be speaking in your kids' lives when they hit puberty, when they're teenagers? Those are such great, great years. And you really want to make sure that there's a lot of, that you spend a lot of time in their corner um, and not just as their sole primary <laughs> teacher. And I'm so thankful for that advice because that has been so life-giving for that relationship. I've seen that in my own family as well. So my oldest is now 17 and, or the, maybe by the time this recording comes out, he'll be 18. I don't know, speaking into the future self, but um, so I have, I have teenagers, high schoolers, tweens, and then um, elementary. And, you know, I have seen such value in them being able to learn from godly wise mentors, um, both in academic and non-academic ways. Yeah. And then with my oldest, as he has begun 
uh, taking some steps out into the collegiate world. I have loved being able to still be his mom mentor, like to still be the safe family where he can come and be like, look at this crazy assignment I just got, like this essay, you know, what and how do I even approach this as a Christian and like within the realm of this assignment, you know, a constraint that's given, but to be able to still be able to talk to them through some of those things. And so, yeah, I have other friends who haven't been able to, to outsource classes like that hasn't been in the family budget, but that just because you can't outsource a class doesn't mean you can't still incorporate some of these uh, mentors. Maybe it's a grandparent that can, can meet or over, even over the computer and talk to them or someone in the homeschool community or at church. There's lots of creative ways to kind of bring other ideas, both the positive influences, which should be obviously most of them, and also some maybe challenging ways while they're still at home and you can have those discussions together. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I would really love to talk to you a little bit about your adventures homesteading. Uh, Before we started (laughs) recording, you were mentioning you were chasing a pig. So I'm just fascinated (laughs) by this whole idea. I'm like, I can barely like keep my children fed, let alone homeschool them. And you're like running a farm too. It's so cool. So I need to know, how did you decide to pursue this homesteading adventure? And tell us what it looks like in real life. Because I have a feeling it's probably not like what we might envision in an Instagram reel. No. I mean, all those homesteading accounts start to congeal into like one impossible woman that doesn't exist anyway. It's the same thing with homeschooling, right? Right. Um, We build like an Instagram monster of all of our insecurities. And then we think everybody is that monster. (laughs) Um, We started homeschooling, homesteading um, because we loved it, but we were farmless farmers for a really long time. And that's the, that's the best way that I know how to put that. We just didn't have land for a really long time. So it was a lot of dreaming It was a lot of uh, learning while we were in the waiting room, Uh, like learning how to make sourdough bread or canning or um, just any little thing that we could do, researching, reading, doing as much as we could. Um, Neither one of us um, grew up in on farms. Um, I grew up in Miami. It's very urban. My grandparents had a farm um, and they were both from the country, uh, the countryside of Cuba. And so um, hearing their stories that resonated really deeply with me and kind of created, um, I had, I had a very active inner thought life as a child, (laughs) just, um, just could never stop reading ever and was always very drawn into, um, pastoral books were my bread and butter. I mean, I just, I loved them. And so between my grandparents and all the books I read, I just grew up really yearning for that. And then, um, my husband, his time spent in Honduras, and then obviously when he came over and started spending time with our family, you know, we butcher a pig every year for Christmas for Noche Buena, which we celebrate on December 24th. And after he did that with us a couple of times, he was like, wouldn't it just be so cool if we started doing this? And so eventually we did find our farm and a piece of land, and it was only after like multiple cross-country moves and having our hearts broken and just a lot of loss and crazy things and we ended up here and we were so exhausted and beaten down that we couldn't even get started right away I mean it was really just we threw some chickens in the back and called it good the kids were really really little I was recovering from um, a really terrible accident that left me with um, PTSD so I was really sick and this farm was built one millimeter at a time. We didn't really have a lot of mentors. YouTube is an incredible resource. We learned a lot of stuff on YouTube. We started reaching out to anybody that we could, visiting farms, um, helping farmers, had hunters come over and help teach us how to butcher. Um, We love pigs. We have a lot of pigs. I think we've got like 20 something pigs right now back there. We have goats that are uh, do any moment. In fact, I went out there just before we recorded to take a look at my one, um, goat who's named Queenie, um, as in Larkside Candleford. She's spiteful. So I feel like she might, she could potentially give birth while we're recording just to stick it to me. Um, and yeah, a lot of chickens and meat birds. And, um, what does that look like in real life? It looks like a lot of failure. Um, it looks like death. It looks like toil. It looks like 
those verses in Genesis after the fall, where God is telling them just how awful it's going to be working the land. Mm -hmm. And that is truly what it looks like, except for the moments where you suddenly have these, like the clouds part. And there are these moments of redemption that are so beautiful and so incredible that you're just left in, um, in complete awe of the Lord and his creation. And, um, I am oftentimes really sad by how much, uh, knowledge, working knowledge has been lost. Um, there's a lot of things about, you know, the modern food culture and this culture in general that just make me very, very, very angry. Um, and the farm is a place where I kind of get to exercise all that out and start learning. We're, we're very, um, communal. We really love having people here. So it sounds crazy, but we invite families over for butchering day. Sometimes people hear that and they're like, ew. Um, but they actually love it. No one likes it, you know, when the shot is fired. That's a sad moment for everybody, but it's over in a second. We read um, Wendell Berry's poem uh, for the hog killing right before, and afterwards everyone gets to work. And it's kind of like those first few chapters of little house in the big woods when they're processing that pig and there is joy and there's playing because we know like this pig is meeting its purpose it is you know it is going to be sustaining and um nourishing people and we're working hard together and we're learning a skill with our hands and every pair of hands is valued and matters and it's it's really great so that was long. Sorry. No, I love that. I love the connection that this has given you both to like the darkest parts of Genesis three, like the real results of the fall, like death, thorns and thistles, failure, all those things, um, the toil and the sweat of your brow, but also the connection to the city garden, right? These hints and glimpses we have of God redeeming and bringing life out of these very same difficult situations. I think that's such a, a beautiful thing. I was talking to someone recently who actually they're very, um, very skilled professional in a, in a very highly technical field, um, but just started a very small little kind of homesteady farm as the, with their family while also continuing to work in the technical field. And so I was asking like what they had learned the most from kind of, it seems two very disparate, uh, callings to pursue simultaneously. And he actually said that one of the things that's changed the most for him is he feels like he understands the Bible in a deeper way, being more connected to the land um, and all the pastoral imagery of scripture is suddenly making so much more sense. And I think that's something we have lost pastoral imagery um, of, of scripture, but also just of literature in general. We were a pastoral community and culture for, you know, thousands of years. It's only recently that we've sort of been um, a, a few steps removed from that. And so uh, it is really interesting. It makes me want to find ways to include those same valuable uh, truths and those valuable attitudes in my life here in the suburbs with a tiny little postage stamp wand. So <laughs> that would be my next question for you. Those of us who God is not currently calling to or blessing with a homestead where we can, you know, have chickens and pigs, um, we would get in big trouble with our HOA. <laughs> 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 I did that. How, what are some ways that we can still kind of pursue these ideas or teach our children to have a connection to the land and to nature and um, to creation around us while living in a city or in the suburbs? Yeah. I mean, it's like anything else in life that you want to pursue when you homeschool, you got to get out of the house, right? Um, it, it is going to require some some driving and some effort. Um, I don't really think that there's any um, simple substitute for it, um, but there's certainly a lot of opportunity. I think more than you realize, um, like I said, we have, you know, a lot of people that come onto our farm. We go on vacation from time to time. So we have friends that live in those HOAs where they're like, we can't have pigs, but when you're on vacation, can we come over and feed your animals? And that's awesome. We have other friends that, you know, are part of CSAs or different farm shares where they will go and participate in those things. Um, 
you know, I think that the postage stamp thing, I remember one of our early, early living situations um, when I was incredibly sick and bedridden. Um, we just didn't have a lot of space. It's funny how we went to the same park like every other day um, and we would sing the same song on the way to the same park and we would eat the same snack and we would tell the same stories and play the same games and it was okay because for my kids that wasn't boring or monotonous for them that was like a life-saving security that they needed in a time that was that felt really unstable and you know they loved that repetition that became their their place there's a lot of value in having um just a small corner of the earth that is yours that you visit over and over again but it's yours and you know the names of all the plants and you know the names of all the trees that are in there and you know their stories and maybe you planted one of the things that are in there and you get to watch it grow um so i think sometimes we think oh my child has to have this connection with nature and when we hear that we think of like amazing things we see on instagram like i'm in awesome times of the things that I see from friends that live in California where I'm like, oh my gosh, like Florida's flat as a pancake. Mike, have they ever, have my kids ever been on like a hike hike? They've been on a death march in the swamp. Have they ever like climbed a mountain? I just, that that's something that I would love for them to have. But then I'm like, wow, we get to go to the beach. This is incredible. Like uh, we still have little things that we get to do here. And when I lived in the Midwest and I first got there, I was like, wow, this is a lot of corn. Um, but then we started <laughs> going other places and I'm like, oh my gosh, I never understood what a prairie really was. Like, I just, I couldn't even build that in my mind. I don't think I ever saw the sky really, truly until I came out here. There were so many beautiful things about the Midwest that I was not expecting. So it's, it's really just loving the area that you're in and not overcomplicating it, being okay with something small and knowing that if anything, God is a God of taking small things and multiplying abundantly more than we could ever imagine. Some of my my sweetest nature interactions to this day didn't actually happen on our farm. They happened in our 900 square foot home with a tiny backyard. I love that encouragement. You know, when one of the trees that has a very dear place in my heart is a weeping willow tree randomly. And it's because when I was like four years old and my family, we lived in um, a townhouse in a different state and obviously not very much like land around, but my mom, I, I don't have very many memories from that time. I remember the weeping willow trees and I remember breaking my collarbone. That's pretty much my memory. <laughs> um, I remember though, we would walk around this little lake, which in my head is like a big lake, but I'm sure like if I saw it now, it was probably just like a little drainage pond, right? But it was surrounded by weeping willow trees. And my mom would walk me around and she would sing the Alice the Camel has 10 humps song. I don't know if you know that song. <laughs> it's a counting song. And we would take the weeping willow branches and we would make necklaces and crowns out of them. And so always, I have always longed to have a weeping willow tree. Still haven't had one as an adult, but, and all that to say, like sometimes it's those simple things and I will never forget that tree. There's something kind of connected in a simple way, but it was a, a relational story too, so. I, I'm always astounded. Young children never need as much curriculum as we think they do. We hear about something and we're like, what book can I buy? What, what program can I buy? What thing can I buy to establish this relationship? And especially when they're that little, I mean, they're really just looking for things to love. That's all. Yeah. They're just their little hearts looking for the next thing to attach their hearts to. I, I, I think the vast majority of the time when the boys were especially little and we were thinking about like, okay, what nature thing should we go to next? What other things can we do to, you know, I was always thinking about it from what educational thing while I was still in my like traditional school detox mode. Um, and my boys were really asking, what are we going to love next? And when I finally made that shift to thinking about like, what are we going to love next? Wow, like that changed everything for me because the pressure was off. It wasn't like, what am I going to teach them about? It's what are we going to love next out in nature or in our home or people in our community? And that was wonderful. That's when we really started learning together. So yeah, I'm, I'm a big fan of people that make the most of every millimeter of their postage stamp because that's what builds relationship. Yeah. 
definitely. Well, Elsie, you've kind of mentioned and alluded that there have been times and seasons as a mom that have been really challenging. And I know homeschool moms who are listening to this right now, many of us can relate to being in a season where we're tired or discouraged or overwhelmed, maybe something within our own hearts, or maybe the situations are just really difficult. And it can feel overwhelming to try to still be what we think of as a good homeschool mom in the midst of that. We wonder, you know, are we failing our children? <laughs> That's the big question. You know, we, we sometimes worry in those times. So I was wondering if you had any encouragement or things that you would want to say to a mama who is in that situation. I mean, it's going to sound terrible, but the encouragement I can give you is that you're going to fail your children in some way. I mean, it is, it's unavoidable. You're going to fail them in some way. So rather than sitting there and letting those demons prey on you late at night when you're laying in your bed, grieving all the things that you didn't do that day, all the missed opportunities, all of the things that haunt you, that you let tear you into pieces, realize that, okay, I'm going to fail my children. So rather than put all my energies on worrying about the big bad what if, put your energy into building a relationship with your kids that can recover from things. Um, uh, you know, that, like I said, there was, um, there have been several seasons in our life where mental illness has been a horrible beast in our home. And it's been, um, really difficult to try to get <clears throat> a handle on how to mother and how to homeschool and how to do all of these things while still wrestling um, with PTSD and all of the other offshoots of that that end up happening. Um, again, it really just comes down to the relationship and what we have inclined our hearts to. I Discouragement is horrible and it's especially horrible when you're isolated and lonely. Um, unfortunately, I think when we hit the peak of our hardest time was also the moment in our life story, love story, where we were also at our loneliest. Mm -hmm. So that just made everything really, truly extra painful. And I know it's hard because this requires vulnerability, having to put yourself out there again, especially if you've been hurt by your family, hurt by a church, hurt by a, you know, a homeschool community or whatever, and it really stinks to try again. But the fact of the matter is, is you need to be built up and you need encouragement. Um, I think um, for myself, when I was um, bedridden, the only activity I was allowed to get up, they said I could get up once a week to do something. And so I chose um, Bible study fellowship, BSF. That's what I did. My husband would drive me to BSF and I would go and I would study scripture and be with these other women that encouraged me and loved me. And um, that meant so much. God used that so much in my life. And I don't really like being vulnerable. I'm not a very emotional person. My husband, Jeff, is the weeper of the two of us. I am always super uncomfortable if I start getting anywhere near teary. And man, did I ever break down in that class. And it was just, it was something that I really needed. So, you know, you as a mom need relationship in your life. Um, be vulnerable and ask for help and do whatever you need to get those relationships in your life. And then again, focus on building those relationships with your kids. Um, read together and go outside and play and ask them. You know, I, I do this thing every year before I start homeschool planning. It's going to sound weird, but I ask my kids to show me their dream house, where they want to live when they grow up. And sometimes they've made it with Play-Doh or they've drawn it or they built it with sticks but it's like this little peek into their hearts and the things that they really value and the things that they love. Cause you better believe they put that in their house, right? Um, a little girl that loves horses is going to build a stable in her future dream home. Um, a little boy that loves farming is going to have a 5,000 acre ranch. Um, and you get that little picture into their hearts. And that is always so helpful for me to start out the year, not thinking about what did we not do well last year? What are we going to accomplish this year? but rather who is this person that I'm spending all of this time with, that I am loving, that I am called to disciple and bring up 
and yeah, I, I would just encourage you greatly focus on relationships for yourself, for your kids. Don't lose sight of who they are when you're stacking this huge list of all the things you feel like you should be doing. That's the fastest way to lose sight of your kids. Yeah. Cause what would it profit us to check off all 27,000 things on our to-do list and lose the relationship with our kids? That's not what any of us want. So that's a really important and good reminder. And I think it's easy. We we kind of say this and then we're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Relationships first. Um, Yeah, yeah. Homeschooling is about relationships. And then we freak out about the checklist or whatever. And there are things obviously we want to do and to be faithful in that. But to make sure that we're going back again and again to that relationship and that love of the real people in our in our homes, I think is such a, a good, valuable reminder. I, I believe it firmly enough that I would even go so far as to say that if you were in a place where you were truly ill and really, really struggling and you have to choose between being their mom and their teacher, be their mom. Yeah. Because you're the only one they got. Yeah. Really good reminder. Yeah. Uh, this has been such a great conversation. I want to like, keep chatting with you. I'm glad to get to, to know you a little bit, but I better move on to the final questions that I have for all of my guests. And the first one is just, what are you personally reading lately? Okay. So I'm about to enter the last year of my thirties and as my gift to myself, I am just rereading only my favorite books. Um, I did that the last year of my 20s and it was so great and I'm doing it again for the last year of my 30s and it feels totally decadent because I know everything is going to be a hit. There will be no misses and even better, I get to experience them again with, for some of them, 10 years of life experience tacked on so I get to see it from a different perspective with kids that are getting older and, you know, a longer marriage and all of those things. So. Um, right now I'm wrapping up The Count of Monte Cristo. David Copperfield is next. That's one of my top three. Who's coming next? I've got a lot of Thomas Hardy on the list, Frankenstein, Persuasion, uh, Till We Have Faces, The Scent of Water. I mean, like, there's like, I think, well, I picked 40 for 40. <laughs> I love this idea so much. I'm going to steal this idea. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, I just, I just, I've been wondering, I was like, what should I do? I wanted to do something like meaningful and fun in the year leading up to 40, but I couldn't think of anything. I'm like, this is it. I'm going to pick my 40 favorite movies. <laughs> well, I have so many friends that are like, I'm going to learn a language. I'm going to do this. And I'm like, how do you have the energy to do that? I'm in that special like armpit of motherhood right now where I have teens that don't drive. Ah, and it's like, I'm in the car so much and all, you know, all of those things. I'm like, I don't have the energy to go like learn a whole new thing. I've got all these other things I'm learning with homesteading and I just need something that's a hit that I can like, that I know, like this is reliable. Like I'm going to have a good time doing this. And so I was like, I'm just, I'm going to reread all of my favorite books. So I, I put together the list of 40 and whew, started a month early just to give myself a little headspace and like, it's going to be a great year. <laughs> that was so fun. Well, and I think you picked a good Jane Austen. My daughter and I actually did a little mini. She wanted to do her own little podcast. So we did a little mini podcast. Um, and we, we read through Persuasion again together and discussed it because we both agree that Captain Wentworth is the best of all the Jane Austen heroes. The He's the best. Hands down. Hands down. That's oh, my goodness. Okay. okay. Final That's question good. is, what would be your best tip for helping the homeschool day run smoothly? <laughs> oh my goodness best tip for helping homeschool day run smoothly ish ish <laughs> um well there are two small things that come immediately to mind and the first is to never be afraid to hit the reset button um I think we just Sometimes we look at our schedules and we just forget that our kids are human. And if you have more than one child, if you have more than two, if you have more than three, if you have more than four, like the odds of someone having a bad day are just, I mean, there's the chance it's going to happen. So don't be afraid to hit the reset button on the spaces, you know, and I, we do that a lot with our kids. Whenever we finish with something, I'll say reset and they'll like 
put the stuff away in that room that we were just in and then we'll move into the next room and we will get a, a, a scene change so like if you have a kid that um you know my, my youngest has special needs when he was really struggling learning how to read i could not do reading at the dining room table and then say okay well that was that's over let's do history and expect him to be able to continue in the same space he needed to actually break away from that and so even if it's just moving from the dining room table to the couch or from the couch to the tree outside you know hitting not being afraid to hit the reset button that helps a lot and then um I think having a definite close to the day. So, you know, we started with morning time for years, which actually we don't do morning time in the morning anymore because it doesn't bless us. We do it at lunch now. We switch morning time is lunch, lunch time. Sure. <laughs> morning time is lunch now. Um, but having that actual close to the end um, where we would get together and talk about the things that we all learned, especially as the kids are older and we're not all doing the same subject at the same time anymore. It's such a good way to come together at the end of the day and kind of like button things up and be on the same page. And it gives the little kids something to look forward to. It helps remind the older kids of younger, precious things that are really beautiful and worthy. Like the other day, my youngest told something, shared something, a picture book that we had read. And my eldest was like, oh, we read that. And guess what? After dinner, he went and got that book and read that picture book. And I was, you know, washing dishes, like <laughs> trying not to trying not to cry. So having that little family time at the end of the day um, to look forward to, to connect with dad when dad comes home, you know, what did you guys do today? Hey, here's what we did. We just talked about it. Um, that has been really helpful for us. I love seeing the older kids want to bring out a favorite thing for the younger one. My 12 year old recently was like, had this <laughs> crisis moment where she was like, all of these picture books we've never read with Isaac. So she took a piece of paper and like went to our picture bookshelf and was like writing a out a huge long list. She was like, these are the most important ones. Mom, can this count as some of my reading time for school? She's not a big reader. So she's like, can this count as some of my reading time for school if I read these to Isaac? I was like, sure. <laughs> Sounds like a great idea. Because again, it's also the relationship of the two of them. It's the relationship that they're having with each other. I love that. I love it. Elsie, where can people find you all around the internet? Oh, I kind of hate the internet. So I try to avoid it in a lot of spaces. But uh, so Instagram on occasion, um, my blog, when I'm in a season of like, yay, I feel like writing. Um, I'm not in that season right now. But you can read a lot of stuff from when I was in that season, especially when the kids were younger. And then I do like to write for Wild and Free. Um, so that's another place where you can find me. And I will have links to those places in the show notes for this episode over at humilityanddoxology.com. Thanks so much for taking the time to chat with me today. And uh, I look forward to seeing Queenie's goat kids. <laughs> Thank you. Me too. Thank you, Amy.